Hello everybody and thank you for joining this webinar to celebrate the completion of phase one of Project Hercules. My name is Emily Crossley and on behalf of Alex Johnson, Fleur Chandler and Josie Godfrey, I would like to warmly welcome you all. And we're going to start off with a very short film to set the scene. First, you have to prove that your drugs are safe and effective and they work against placebo. The second challenge is to prove that those drugs are cost effective, that they offer value for money. Both of these mountains need to be climbed, but both need different equipment to climb them. And with Project Hercules, together we've built a path up that mountain. Our charity Duchenne UK created Project Hercules. It's about collaboration. And it's about getting smarter, about anticipating the challenges of access and trying to deal with them head on. Nobody in the entire drug development landscape had tried this before us. Things like getting drug companies, competitors, to collaborate and work together to agree ways to develop the best evidence for Duchenne and to best measure the value of their drugs. Engaging with hundreds of Duchenne families to really find out what's important to them and to really understand this disease. These things were unheard of before Project Hercules. Well, I see this from both sides um, as the mother of a child with Duchenne and also as a health economist with many years experience in the big pharma industry. Um, assessing the value of medicines and ensuring that patients get access to those medicines. What we've achieved here is nothing short of remarkable to have brought this evidence base together and presented it in a way that will help those, those bodies gain access for uh, Duchenne medicines is truly amazing and it's a remarkable accomplishment. I don't think we ever thought we'd be in this position when we started Project Hercules. I'm an independent consultant working with Project Hercules and I've never seen this level of achievement in this amount of time. We've created a new way of measuring the quality of life of people with Duchenne, allowing us to measure what really matters to patients and families. And finally, we've created a better understanding of the disease cycle, allowing much better clinical trials. All these things contribute to reducing the length of time between drug development and treatments actually reaching patients. From a clinical point of view, what Project Hercules has achieved is impressive and will really contribute to the process of providing effective treatment to patients. The project will impact future clinical practice and also clinical trial design and will ensure a fair assessment of drug for DMD by the regulators. It's something unlike anything that I've seen before. Phase one of Project Hercules is now finished. We've had enormous successes beyond our wildest dreams and the expectation of others. But the race goes on, the clock is still ticking, which is why we've launched phase two of Project Hercules and we hope to have the same impact into the future. So we happen to be celebrating the achievements of Hercules on a day that will go down in history, the first patient to be dosed with Pfizer's COVID vaccine. If this tumultuous year has reminded us with more power than we ever could have imagined with the announcement of not one, but three COVID-19 vaccines, it's that pharmaceutical companies have that unique ability to radically and genuinely transform and improve lives and that with laser-focused vision, collaboration and funding, it is possible to create treatments and vaccines faster than ever before. And it's these same attributes, collaboration, laser-focused vision and funding, that we have been able to deliver Project Hercules. Uh, I'm sure many of you are all too familiar with how the project came about, how in 2014, the European Medicines Agency gave conditional marketing authorization to the first Duchenne muscular dystrophy drug to treat boys with a nonsense mutation, and how it took NICE two and a half years to agree to a managed access agreement, and how during those two and a half years, boys who were eligible for the drug stopped walking, and because the requirement to take it was to be ambulant, they were no longer eligible for a treatment that had been shown to be safe and effective. And in that moment, 
Fleur Chandler came to Alex and I and said, there has to be a better way of doing this. We need to be able to better articulate the patient experience. We've all been on a huge journey since then. And the idea of focusing on the patient experience has become something of a buzzword in recent years. And I think what Hercules has done is to switch up the paradigm. And rather than patients gathering petitions or marching on Downing Street, it has turned that patient experience into the sort of language understood and needed by HTA bodies like NICE. And to me, this is fundamental. To me, Project Hercules is a calling card, a plea, if you like, for no more business as usual. Because if I can be honest with you, I don't want to have to plead for drugs for my son. I don't want regulators to understand what is important to he and I because of the knowledge. For me, I want them to know it because of the information collected by Hercules. Because if you want to develop a drug and then get it reimbursed and you come and ask me what it's like to live with Duchenne, how you can understand the disease, the simple answer is I cannot answer you. I cannot answer you because in order to survive, in order to get through each day, I suppress and ignore what living with Duchenne means. I suppress the emotion when I see my son slipping through my fingers like the sand in an hourglass. I ignore the fact that last year he could hold his toothbrush and brush his teeth and today he can't. I suppress all of my feelings, the daily log that goes on in my mind of the abilities that he is losing. I suppress it all because if I didn't, I would be simply unable to function. And so that is what Project Hercules has done. It has captured the reality of living with this disease over a two year period, interviewing hundreds of patients in a hugely iterative process with the best minds to deliver what we believe are four world-class outputs. We have so many people to thank both in the UK and of course globally, our pharmaceutical partners who took a leap of faith with us in the first place, the patient advocate groups around the world, our vendors, academics, and all of those who've helped us to access critical data and of course the patients. So we're now going to hear about the four key outputs from Hercules. We will have time for a short Q&A at the end, so do please type in your questions in the chat function. So we're going to move on to a short film from Shah um, about the DMD qual. Hi, I'm Philip Powell and I'm a research fellow at Shah Outcomes in the University of Sheffield, UK. I'm going to talk to you about our experience developing the DMD qual as part of the quality of life work stream as part of Project Hercules run by Duchenne UK. The real aim behind this uh, work stream came about from Duchenne UK and from the Duchenne community where parents of people with Duchenne and people with Duchenne themselves were identifying that the existing questionnaires that are available to assess quality of life uh, for people with Duchenne weren't fitting the bill for them. They weren't doing what they thought uh, they should and they weren't capturing what they thought was most important for quality of life for people living with Duchenne. And we conducted some more formal systematic uh, review work into this where we identified the existing questionnaires or patient reported outcome measures that have been used to assess quality of life in Duchenne and we evaluated them using standardized checklists and we found that there was no good quality evidence available for the content validity of these questionnaires for use in Duchenne and by content validity we mean that the evidence was not very strong in terms of their relevance, their comprehensiveness or the extent to which they covered everything of importance or their comprehensibility or ease of understanding. So this background led us to our aim which was to, to develop a new quality of life questionnaire for use in Duchenne that better and more accurately, more completely assessed quality of life and to also produce a version that could be used in cost effectiveness analysis of new treatments and interventions that may be developed for Duchenne. And this, this type of analysis requires a specialized kind of questionnaire known as a preference-based measure. The development process of the DMD qual consisted of three stages. The first stage was the item generation, so we conducted some literature reviews to identify what was already known about quality of life in Duchenne, and we used this to form an interview schedule for our qualitative interviews 
um, with boys and men of varying ages that had Duchenne to talk to them about what was important to them in terms of their quality of life. And we spoke to 18 boys and men with Duchenne and we transcribed all of those interviews and conducted a framework analysis to identify a thematic framework of quality of life that we hope best captured quality of life and the important elements of it within the Duchenne community. And from that framework we generated some draft questions that could be used in a potential quality of life questionnaire and we took them forward to stage two which was item selection. Now in stage two we take the draft set of items or questions that have been developed and we assess them further and try and refine them further to get to an eventual final set of questions. Um, and to do this we use several different techniques. The first is cognitive debriefing which is a fancy term to describe us talking to people about what they thought about the questionnaire in terms of whether the questions were relevant, whether they were comprehensive and covered everything that they thought was important to quality of life in Duchenne and whether they were understood in the way that they were intended to be understood. So we did that with some patients, with some parents of patients and with some clinicians to get those different viewpoints to incorporate in the design of the questionnaire. So we used the responses from that exercise to further refine the set of questions we had and then we we took those questions and put them into an online survey which we sent out to over a hundred people living with Duchenne uh, to fill in uh, alongside some pre-existing quality of life questionnaires and background questions and we, we conducted some standard um, psychometric or statistical analysis on the, the outcome of that survey to ascertain how well each of the questions was performing um, quantitatively. And we combined that information with a consultation with patients, health economists and clinicians and also a translatability assessment of how good each of the questions were in terms of their ease of translation into other languages which is important for future use of the measure in terms of its take up internationally. We use those sources of information to make a final selection of items or questions that would become the final DMD qual. The final stage, stage three, was then the extra bit that needed to happen to make the questionnaire more specialised for use in cost effectiveness analysis. Um, so we used standardised health economics techniques with the general population um, to, in a choice task or discrete choice experiment for them to identify the relative importance that they placed on each of the elements of quality of life that was asked about in the questionnaire. And they give us what's known as preference or utility weights, so this, this um, data or information describing the importance of each uh, question in the questionnaire and when that's combined with the results of the questionnaire, this information can all be used in the cost-benefit analysis of treatments. The resulting product was a 14-item quality of life questionnaire for use in Duchenne. Anyone from seven years upwards can uh, fill this in or have this filled in for them. Um, and this became known as the DMD qual. The second product was a reduced eight item preference based measure with those provisional utility or preference weights that can be used within cost benefit analysis and this was called the DMD qual 8D and both of those measures are available now for use and both in self report and proxy versions and so if you are interested in using either of those measures please do contact Oxford University Innovation Clinical Outcomes who are licensing the measure. So I just wanted to touch really on the potential for impact that um, the DMD qual and the quality of life workstream has within Project Hercules. So a key thing to understand is that quality of life questionnaires uh, and preference based measures are used to assess patient outcomes both in the clinic and in the trials of new treatments and interventions. So in a way the evidence that's generated from those trials affects what treatments are funded. So in order to have faith in that evidence and to make sure the, the best treatments are funded, we need to be sure that what's being measured in terms of quality of life is as accurate as possible and meaningful to the Duchenne community. 
So we know in the motivation for this work that Duchenne UK and the wider community were not happy with pre-existing questionnaires and thought that they may be inadequate for fully capturing quality of life within Duchenne. So in developing the DMD qual with the help of the Duchenne community, we believe that we've made a better tool or better questionnaires for assessing quality of life in Duchenne, which will hopefully then feed into a better assessment of the, the effectiveness of new treatments and interventions. And in doing so, make sure the right treatments and interventions are being funded and therefore improving quality of life in the long run. The final thing I'd just like to talk about is the benefits we got from being involved in Project Hercules. So we're very clear that this work could not have been done and the DMD qual would not have been achieved without the right collaborations with others, including with the Duchenne community. And so Project Hercules provided the scaffold um, for access to these collaborations and for the development of a quality of life questionnaire within a rare disease um, without Project Hercules access to patients and expertise may have been particularly difficult. Um, we had access to a range of patient advisors, clinicians, academics both with expertise in Duchenne and in quality of life measurement, uh, leading pharmaceutical companies and health technology assessment agencies providing a industry and applied perspective. And so all of this expertise and feedback was absolutely crucial in generating the best possible meaningful quality of life questionnaire that we could. And a final way that we think Project Hercules will continue to play a key role in the life of the DMD qual is to support its dissemination and uptake within the Duchenne community. You know, this is a questionnaire that was made with the help of the Duchenne community for people in the Duchenne community. And we see Project Hercules as a key vehicle uh, for helping its future dissemination and success. So all that remains is for me to thank everyone that was involved in this research to thank Duchenne UK uh, and everyone involved in Project Hercules and the funders. Um, we really appreciate all the support that we have, we've had during this project. It's been great and it's been a really worthwhile project to be involved in. Thank you. So we're now going to hear a presentation from Jamie O'Hara and HCD Economics. Hello and welcome to our presentation. Uh, this will summarise the burden of illness work done on the Hercules project by HCD Economics. You can see on the slide the wonderful team that have put this work together. So just as a brief recap, I won't torture this slide. Um, this outlines the methodology that's been applied and we've recruited physicians, appropriate physicians, um, who in turn have recruited patients and caregivers into the project. Um, and as part of the project, they've transposed the patient's medical record into an online database, giving us a really comprehensive picture of the direct medical costs attributable to each individual patient enrolled into the study. Individual patients and caregivers are then asked to complete corresponding uh, forms that give us an insight into the indirect cost and quality of life detriment associated with the condition. Um, we, I think there's around a 40% completion rate in, in this section. So next, this uh, shows how the patients fall into each of the health states that have been developed by the wider Hercules team. Um, obviously, this is a rare disease and uh, seven states is, is quite a lot. Um, and what's happened is we've, we've allocated those patients subject to the information we've received from the physicians and patients themselves um, and, and put them into the mutually exclusive states identified by the Hercules group. You can see the allocation in this in this slide. So in terms of medical appliances, you can see that um, it's, it's quite intuitive. Um, it, one question that was raised was the ventilation in some of the earlier stages of the condition. However, 
um, what we've learned after, after consulting with some of the participating physicians and the KOL th physicians involved in the study is that sometimes patients can be allocated ventilation equipment in the early stages of the disease to familiarise themselves and obviously the caregivers uh, with, with this equipment. Uh, and so this is just sort of one extract. So this is the consultant, the consultation rates with the management managing physicians, which you can see are quite consistent throughout the, the individual patient journey. Um, and, uh, and that goes for both scheduled and unscheduled. I, I guess there's a one note where the elevation is the spike in late ambulatory uh, unscheduled consultations, which you can see in the second set of bars there. Um, I, I guess that's kind of because of, as and when the, the condition is starting to, to really progress. So in so that, that was kind of an extract from the direct resource utilization, but there's, there's a lot of information in there that we can subsequently use. Um, and then from the PPIE data, which is the form that's completed by the patient, and we've also got some forms completed by the carer that we'll have a brief look at in a moment. So we've just tried to extract some, well, what we feel is interesting um, and kind of hard hitting, particularly from a advocacy perspective. But this is one of our questions. So it's question 35 in the PPIE form. Does the patient need assistance with daily activities such as dressing, eating, bathing, walking or toileting? And you can see that the vast majority of patients do. Um, and it's informal assistance, which probably speaks to a lot of the indirect costs that we'll have a look at later on, because this is obviously an opportunity cost for the economy. And this is um, a, a different, the same information broken out in uh, by disease progression. And you can see it's it's quite, well, it's quite consistent, uh, but we've got some very low ends in some of these as well, because like I say, the PPIE forms were completed at about a rate of 40%. So we, uh, when they are disaggregated into the different disease states identified by the, the modeling team, then this is kind of what we see. So when we think about the caregiver data um, extracted from the PPIE form, so this is probably informal carers, parents, or, or whoever uh, completing these data, we ask, have you missed work because of your uh, caregiving duties with the person with DMD in the last three months? And it, the, the majority have said that they haven't actually missed work, but that there have been problems. Um, so it's it, it is a, an it does provide an impact on the day to day living of the caregivers, which you would expect. And it's notoriously difficult to tease this sort of narrative out of data, but kind of I think this is quite a nice message. And in terms of uh, caregiver work productivity, you, you can see that. So for those that are familiar with the WPAI tool, um, it's, it's a validated instrument and, and quite well utilised across different disease areas um, because it's a generic tool. But you can see that there's, there's quite high activity impairment, work impairment and issues with presenteeism. And, and it, it, that's that, that's really important information because not only is it in, not only does this condition obviously directly impact the patients, it, it also really does impact the lives of the carers and their ability to participate in the economy. So the socioeconomic costs and this, whilst nice don't routinely take this sort of information into account. I think um, kind of these these information will speak for themselves. The, these are really quite. So this is the direct costs, um, and these are very conservative too. Uh, the, the the reason being is that when equipment and things like that, in particular, and medical devices are invested in, it it can you can have the same wheelchair, for instance, for many years. Home alterations are likely to only be done once, so 
there, there are some things that we can do to, I, I think, to augment this, but obviously it'll have to be with the blessing of the, the group. But nonetheless, you can see that there's some um, real significant costs in here. And in terms of the non-medical costs, um, again, it, these are direct costs, so kind of attributable to what we were just looking at. Smaller numbers, but still not insignificant. And then this is the big part that I mentioned at the top when we were thinking about the socioeconomic picture. The indirect costs are pretty big. <laughs> you can see this is this is the untold story of many many diseases, particularly at, at rare conditions, where you've got just huge opportunity costs to the economy. So we take a human capital approach when um, undertaking these these uh, uh, undertaking these studies. And there's just so many people that are unable to work or are impaired with regards to how much they can work or their career progression. And this is the picture that it shows. So this is the driving factor. So it's crazy that nice don't take this sort of thing into consideration. So these are the total costs. And, and as I say, I, like kind of the team and I and the subcommittee that we've been verifying these with within Project Hercules believe these to be quite conservative. So that um, that completes our summary of the project. Um, kind of, we, we're happy to receive any messages or in, inquiries with regards to to the work so far. But um, kind of, congratulations to the Hercules team on doing such a great job, and equally to my team for doing a great job internally at HCD as well. Uh, like I say, contact if you require any more information. Thanks very much. So we're now going to hear from Julie Mumby Croft and Source HEOR. I'm Juliet Mumby Croft from Source Health Economics, and I'm going to introduce you to the cost effectiveness model for Duchenne muscular dystrophy that was developed as part of the Project Hercules project. We set out to develop a core disease level model framework with a consistent structure, health states and core data set to be used for any intervention in DMD. The model is a template, which means that some adaptation will be required by companies to account for different methods of administration or different patient access schemes, for example. The model has been designed to be flexible to allow the user to define their specific decision problem. To define the target population, the user will specify their mean age and the distribution of patients across health states at baseline. As treatment effects can vary from one intervention to another, the model includes options for different tre treatment effects. This includes symptom control, slowing progression, halting progression, or in the case of regenerative therapies, improving function. And the model allows for a combination of these effects to be defined. It also allows the user to define different methods of administration and treatment rules, such as treating to loss of ambulation. The model has placeholders for up to three comparators and the user can adjust the natural history model to reflect changes in the comparator landscape over time. In terms of outcomes, the model allows the user to select from three types of analysis, cost utility analysis, cost effectiveness analysis or cost consequence analysis. This selection will inform the outcomes that are shown on the results screen. Available outcomes include costs, life years gained, quality adjusted life years, years to loss of function and cost effectiveness outcomes such as the cost per quality. In terms of the perspective, the model was initially developed for the UK, but the user can select from a third party payer to or societal perspective. The time horizon is the lifetime of patients, although this is variable and can be overtyped by the user. 
The model is a multi-state model and the health states are based on the natural history model developed by the University of Leicester. There are ambulatory states and non-ambulatory states and an intermediate state in which patients can stand for a period of time to facilitate transfer. Health states are associated with a cost and a health state utility. The arrows on this model schematic denote the permissible transitions from state to state. The core data set will be derived from other Project Hercules work streams. The transition probabilities for standard of care have been derived from the natural history model. Resource use estimates and health state utilities will be derived from the burden of illness study being undertaken by HCD economics. When you adapt the model, you will need clinical data for your therapy and the comparator. The data inputs you need will depend on your treatment effect. If your treatment slows progression, you'll need a hazard ratio for each health state transition that is affected by your treatment. You will also define the duration of this treatment effect and can define a period of waning effect. If your treatment halts progression, you will need to define the proportion of patients who respond and the duration of the stable period. After this period, the trajectory of the disease will reflect natural history. If you have a treatment which leads to functional improvement, you will need to define the distribution of patients across health states at baseline and following treatment and define the time taken to achieve this functional improvement. The other type of treatment effect is symptom improvement. The user can define adverse event rates and the prevalence of scoliosis and cardiomyopathy, which vary by therapy. You can also define acute events such as fracture, which vary not only by therapy, but also by health state. You'll also need cost data for the intervention and your comparators. This may include drug acquisition, administration, concomitant medications and monitoring as relevant. You'll also need up to date country specific costs for healthcare resource use and societal costs. The default data set is UK costs. There is a technical report that accompanies the model and this can be adapted to inform your HTA submission dossier. There's also a user guide that provides a step-by-step -step guide to the model's functionality and adaptation of the model. If you need further assistance from us at Source Health Economics, this can be commissioned on a case by case basis if required. So what's the significance of this model? It aims to provide you with a robust model methodology that ensures consistent methods across DMD therapy models. This should help maximize the chance of positive HTA recommendation for several reasons. It has clinically relevant health states developed using clinician and patient input. It has a robust core data set for natural history, resource use and utilities, which is rare in rare diseases. The model has also undergone peer review critique throughout its development to ensure that it is robust. We also hope it will provide you with efficiencies in terms of speed of development and cost. So next steps, there will be an updated version of the cost effectiveness model populated with resource use data and utilities from the burden of illness study once these data become available. In the meantime, if you have any further questions or comments on the cost effectiveness model, please read these to Josie. Many thanks. Well, I apologize for the technical difficulties earlier, but I'm glad to say that we have Professor Abrams on the line and I'm just going to share um, my screen now and he can perhaps talk to some of the slides. Okay, if Keith, can you, yeah. can you be unmuted? Um, you can see the first slide there, Keith, just let me know when you want to switch them. Okay. <clears throat> 
Um, so if, if you move on to the next slide, thanks, Emily. Um, so I just want to talk uh, very briefly about that natural history model that both um, uh, HCD and source economics have, have been referring to and how we went about developing it. Um, so so as, um, as I've both mentioned, the, the, there are a number of health states and how we went about defining these health states and identifying them was to really look at both the, the data data that was available, but also to talk to patients, parents, carers, and healthcare professionals, and to look at all other natural history models that are, that, that have been developed. And so we have um, uh, two uh, ambulatory health states. Um, which are defined on the in terms of the ability to to stand from supine to be able to walk ten meters, um, and following sort of those two two ambulatory health states, we have um, an important transfer health state, um, which is where um, patients have lost the ability to walk ten meters. They've lost the ability to stand from supine, but they can still stand. Uh, they can still wait there. And this was identified by, by, by uh, parents and, and carers as being a really important health state um, because one, one, once patients leave that health state, then additional uh, care um, is, is required in order to be able to transfer, for example, from uh, a chair to a bed. After the uh, transfer health state, um, we have a number of, of, of later non-ambulatory states, and, the, and these are really characterized by uh, whether or not patients have hand-to-mouth hand function, um, whether or not they require uh, ventilatory support, whether that be nighttime ventilatory support or, or, or full uh, ventilatory support. Um, in addition to, to the eight uh, health states, obviously what, what we also need to characterize the natural history is life expectancy uh, in each of those, those health states. So if you move on to the next slide. Um, so in terms of data sources to, to be able to estimate how rapidly or, or, or how slowly patients move between health states, we looked at, 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 at really three sources of information. We've been working with the US-based Critical Path Institute um, and collaborating with them as part of their Duchenne Regulatory Science Consortium. And they've amassed uh, 11 registry and contr control arm data sets of, of DMD patients, mainly US-based, uh, that they've been able to share with us um, and we've been able to analyze jointly. Unfortunately, um, those data sets don't always provide the information that, that we need in order to um, uh, populate our model. And so what we also undertook was an elicitation exercise with eight uh, stakeholders in the, in the UK. These were patients, parents, uh, parents, carers, and healthcare professionals in order to provide information in particular about the time and the age or, or the age at which uh, patients might move uh, out of that transfer health state into some of the later non-ambulatory health states. As I said, we also needed life expectancy information. And uh, again, the, the um, crit uh, Critical Path Institute data sets uh, didn't really report that. And so what we did was we undertook a systematic review of published studies uh, and we managed to we managed to recreate uh, patient level data from fourteen of those uh, that we could then analyze to to give estimates of of life expectancy. And in particular, we also looked at analysis stratified by birth cohort. So if we move on to the next slide, please. so this this figure shows the results of that stratified analysis. And, and reassuringly, what it shows is, is that if we look at children born after 1990, their life expectancy is much higher than those born in earlier uh, birth cohorts. Obviously, uh, you can see from the figures in particular, those born before 1970 had much uh, reduced life expectancy. But this, the later cohorts, um, uh, that's it. this has improved significantly. Move on to the lap. Next slide. 
Um, so what what we can the results of of the natural history model enable us to be able to look at how long. Uh, patients will spend in each of those health states and so if if, if we just look at the the um, dark blue uh, area so this is the time uh, sort of the, the proportion of patients at different ages who would be in that very early ambulatory state and you can see that as patients age that drops quite dramatically so it's these sorts of estimates uh, that then really get fed into the uh, economic model um, that source economics have, have, have developed. And next slide. So uh, in terms of summary, what are some of the lessons and take home messages? Well, I think we've, we've discovered that collaboration is, is, is vital. Uh, team science is definitely the, the name of the game. And this is especially true in rare diseases where we need to uh, collaborate and we need to uh, put together data sets from a number of different studies in order to be able to estimate the sorts of quantities that are important to both patients, but also to, to, to payers. Um, natural history models aren't just about data. Um, the, the identification of the, the transfer state came about from stakeholder input. And it was the importance of that to, to stakeholders that, that really uh, led us to to incorporate it and that's going to have an impact in terms of future research because we we need to find we need to collect more better data about that that, that state the published uh, uh life expectancy data uh, shows that life expectancy is improving over time and that the sort of more recent birth cohorts are, are surviving much longer um, there are a number of publications that, that, that are coming out of this work, both in terms of the um, life expectancy work, but also the natural history model itself. And we're also continuing with further research fun funded by NIHR. Uh, we're, part we're partly going to look at uh, NHS electronic health records to get a better estimate of, of life expectancy in, in, in the UK, as well as validate the natural history results uh, with other data sources. Thank you very much. Keith, thank you very much indeed for that. And just to remind everyone that um, we do have a bit of time for a QA and a at the end, so do please type in your questions uh, in the Q&A. Um, but before we go to questions, I just wanted to uh, bring in Professor Ron Aitkast, who is a health economist, um, member of NICE's SH HST, and he really has been instrumental in helping us to shape Project Hercules into what it's become today, um, from a little idea we had um, to what we've achieved and what we've been discussing today. So, um, Ron, I just wanted to firstly thank you so much for all the insights that you have given us over the, the years. Um, and just to have a, a thought from you about what you think the significance of Hercules is. Thank you. Um, I don't know whether you want to see me or not, but um, I seem to be... Um, if we can, uh, that would be nice. <clears throat> well, I just thought that perhaps the system has a, a some sort of aesthetic quality, which is why it's not letting me in. Well, perhaps we'll just make do with your voice for now. Then. You're going to have to make do with my dulcet tones instead. <laughs> um, the um, First of all, um, my involvement uh, was really provoked by my being a member of the highly specialised technologies committee at, at NICE and, and consistently being struck uh, by the difficulty companies have in, in making their cases uh, for um, their products. They, they, they really struggle to actually get across what's required by NICE, which is to demonstrate what the impact will be against the appropriate comparator uh, of the treatment on things that matter to patients. And um, it's particularly the case uh, at HST, we see quite often uh, small companies uh, can't manage to make their cases very well at all. And the general observation uh, applied strongly in the case of Duchenne. Um, first of all, um, there was um, no measure of outcome 
that really reflected the experience of patients. The measure of outcome that was used in the one uh, example uh, in Duchenne's that came to uh, to NICE um, only reflected very poorly the patient related effects of treatment um, and which didn't apply at all actually to, to non ambulatory patients. Um, there was no measure of impact on the health related quality of life of the people who were caring for the boys with DMD. There was um, very poor information on current treatments both the outcomes that are associated with current treatments, including things as basic as uh, current mortality experience, um, and also the costs. So we didn't really have any comparative, good comparative data. Um, there was no agreed basis for modeling the benefits of any new interventions that came along. Um, it wasn't obvious what the best classification of health states would be uh, for, for that modeling to show the progression of the disease and um, there was no basis for estimating the transitions between those, those states. Well, what we've seen in Hercules is that uh, in, in stage one of Hercules is that all except one of those um, uh, issues have been addressed and the other one is being addressed um, in, in, in later work. And um, so my response is bravo to all concerned um, it's been a great piece of work um, in the Duchenne space and it reflects great credit on the energy of Fleur and Emily and others in actually really make, trying to make sure that this, this happens. Um, and it should make it a lot easier for companies bringing their products to HGA agencies in general, not just NICE, but I expect certainly when I see um, other companies coming to NICE in the Duchenne space, that they'll really have quite a good base for uh, demonstrating the effects of their treatment. And actually, as a committee member, it means that a lot of the undergrowth has just been cut away. Instead of spending hours and hours and days and days trying to work out what we make of this particular treatment, because we don't know what its impact is on in relevant dimensions, there's now a basis for demonstrating that to us, and it should speed the whole process up uh, tremendously. And um, the other thing I'd say is I think it's just a shining exemplar uh, to other rare diseases. And so um, I'm hoping I see more of this kind of collaboration. Thank you. Thanks ever so much, Ron, and we wholeheartedly agree with you. We, we do hope that this model may well be rolled out to other disease areas because we think it is going to make a huge difference. Um, so I'm going to go now to, I think, Dr. Michaela Guglieri is with us, um, who has been um, a vital part of feeding in to Project Hercules with the clinician's viewpoint. And Michaela, I just wanted to ask you, um, what difference um, has your involvement and the findings of Hercules made, do you think, on, on clinical practice for Duchenne? Um, I make just a I don't know if also the video might work or not, but I may just comment that obviously we as we have been trained as clinician, and uh, uh, so the for me personally I was involved first of all with a, a, a discussion within Nice with Arthur Luren, and is a word completely new for clinicians, especially for neuromuscular specialists, where until a few years ago we did not have any uh, treatment that was even considered for uh, approval. So it's been a really exponential learning uh, process in terms of uh, what really need to be considered when we, uh, uh, we talk about translational research and developing new treatment for uh, rare disease, for any disease, but specifically for rare diseases. So I think that has had a, a huge impact in terms of uh, um, probably not really the clinical practice, but what we need to look at and uh, um, these are, from my perspective, has influenced my way, for example, to review clinical trial protocols or to uh, comment on a clinical trial design, but also in terms of what we collect in our clinical practice in order to really assess uh, the, the disease and gave, me, gave us, I think, clinician a new perspective of how to look at the impact of uh, a, a severe condition such as Duchenne has on the life of the patient and their family. So 
I think that is, again, for us has been a, a significant learning process, but I think that uh, health economy is a new term that has been introduced, I think, in the neuromuscular field, and it will become more and more important in the upcoming years. Thank you so much, Michaela. Um, we have a question um, from Manoj. Uh, treatments for DMD have always been viewed as a cocktail of treatments, especially to the various effects from the condition. How does qual and burdens get adjusted as treatments are approved from a pair perspective? And how do we ensure that these don't get diluted over time? Um, I'm going to say, uh, Josie, would you like to answer that? Phil, would you like to answer that? Jamie? Not particularly. <laughs> um, no, it is quite a technical, a technical question. So I'd probably be be looking at maybe either Phil, Ron, or Fleur who might be able to speak from uh, a health economist perspective. It's, I'm, I'm not sure that I, it's Ron here. I'm not sure that I fully, uh, I, that not quite uh, understood the question. Um, oh, the host now actually wants me to start my video. <laughs> okay. Um, up until now, it's been regarded as too frightening. Well, I, I think we, we, we often think about Duchenne, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the rosy golden future where there are multiple treatments. And I suppose the question is, do the outputs from Hercules, will they make it easier for combination therapies um, to be, for patients to gain access? Um, what are the challenges in creating combination treatments or in there being many treatments for Duchenne? Yeah, I mean, let's just hope that we do indeed get those treatments because having this problem would be a real luxury. Um, and, um, but I can see how from a manufacturer point of view that, that uh, it, it is an issue. So, um, it's, it's, it's rather like the work that, that Keith was describing. He was demonstrating that over time, um, the existing treatments have improved the uh, experience of the boys. Um, and um, when uh, there are new treatments that come in, um, each one that comes along after that will indeed have to take that as being the comparator. And we'll look at the, um, the benefits that the new treatment provides relative to that older one. And um, so in that sense, um, you, can, you can say it's diluted, but of course what we're talking about here is steady progression in terms of the uh, quality of outcome uh, for the boys. And um, so that's what has to be done. But what we've got is um, a, a starting layer from which we can start estimating what the benefits are of the treatments as they come in. Thanks very much, Ron, for taking that question. I'm going to bring in Fleur Chandler now, without whom none of this would have happened. Uh, she has such a unique perspective in this space. And Fleur, I just wanted to bring you in um, to say firstly, thank you very much for the incredible work you've done in driving Hercules um, and to ask you to say a few words. Oh, thank you, Emily. Um, I, I think it, it's just been a culmination of when somebody's um, professional and personal lives collide um, in a in a very significant manner and um, I'm just really happy that I've managed to bring the, my the professional side of my world across into the personal side um, and that that includes you know uh, roping all these people into the project that Ron included Michaela Josie um, Shah Keith Jamie um, all of those people and it's because I had that connection in that in that professional world. But um, and now it's it's not even about sort of things that will help my particular situation, but it's around the whole Duchenne community. And I think this has just been a really real shining example of actually where industry can step up and really support um, patients and the the willingness to get engaged from everybody concerned has been staggering. So I'm just, I'm really proud of it as a, as a piece of work um, and also to ensure that we can, as Ron says, make, make it easier for these drugs as they do come through to not fall at the final hurdle, which is that of the payer. Um, that's, that's really all I've got to say. I'm just so proud of it as a, as a, as a piece of work. Um, 
and I, I would also really hope that other rare diseases can can pick it up and, and use it too. Thank you so much, Fleur. Um, I'm just going to bring in uh, co-founder of Duchenne UK, Alex Johnson, just to say a few words because she's sort of been observing Hercules, um, hasn't been as intimately involved in it, but nevertheless, um, I think it would be interesting to share your perspective, Alex. Well, I'm going to say, wow, well, <laughs> to start off with, I just, I want to say how proud I am of Emily. Well, for, for starters, me and Emily, I think when our sons were diagnosed, I had no idea really what health economics was, who nice were, any of these words. This was a language that was completely foreign to us. So firstly, I am so proud of Emily for really, on behalf of the Shen UK, taking on this project and kind of getting to grips with it, you know, you are incredible. And Fleur, I think there's one word to describe you, legend. I mean, this just would not have happened without you. So thank you so much. And Josie, I actually remember the first time I met Josie Godfrey and it was at one of the um, scoping meetings for Atalurin. And I think I literally had Josie pinned up against a wall interrogating her. <laughs> and it was the most uncomfortable thing in the world, but she knew how painful that process was. And she's turned something that was so stressful for families and patients into something positive. And I really do think this work that you know you've all collaborated on is going to transform the reimbursement landscape and you know I can't thank enough all of the patient organizations from around the world who have contributed the patients who have given the times to the surveys the clinicians you know you've all given your time and we're extremely grateful and I think just one final comment from me I took part at the weekend in the World of Shem Patient Academy and when I, you hear patients' frustrations about uninclusive clinical trials, everyone focusing on this small ambulant patient population, this narrow window, it does make you realise the importance of identifying these different health states and the opportunities it might give for patients to take part in clinical trials. And I think the other thing that you know came out in the discussions is we're really missing this good quality of life measure so, you know, thank you so much for developing all this great work. And I do think, you know, with the MHRA now having this new innovative licenses, that access pathway, Hercules is going to be amazing for patient engagement and us having that data so that we're not crying hysterical mums, we're mums armed with data and facts and figures. So well done. Thank you so much, Alex. Well, you've brought us so nicely to the conclusion of this webinar. Thank you, everybody uh, who's dialed in to listen. Um, and I think our challenge now is to encourage uptake of the outputs of Hercules. And we're now thrilled to be moving on to phase two to identify some of the gaps, um, to fill in some of the gaps that were identified in phase one. I just want to say once again, a massive thank you to our industry partners who really took a leap of faith in joining with us um, at the start of Project Hercules and I hope that they are as proud as we are of what we have all achieved and again to thank our global supporters, our patient advocacy groups, our vendors and people who provided all the data to help us get to where we got to so please do continue to stay safe everyone, thank you so much for listening, good night.